All right, thanks for sticking around after two very in-depth and detailed uh, talks. You get me. Um, hi, I'm Corey Hinker. I'm based on New York City. I have a consulting company there, and I've been dealing with databases since the early 90s and dealing with Postgres since about 99, 2000. Um, so there's a complaint going around that the only thing worse than the Postgres docs is any other database's docs. Um, <laughs> and that's not a reason for us to rest on our laurels. And so I'm going to be tearing down what we have a bit and also talking about what we can do to possibly make it better in the future and what you can do as well. Um, the documentation is pretty good as a reference which means that you need to know what you're looking for as before you go looking for it. You know, like a dictionary, if you don't know how to spell the word, how are you going to find it? You also need to understand some of the terminology so that you can start digging around for this stuff. And you may not know the right terminology. Either you're new to databases or you're new to Postgres. The terminology has changed slightly. And even once you get there, what you've got is a reference. It is not a how-to. It, uh, it, is, it is descriptive, but it is not instructive. Uh, many people tend to learn by example. The classic uh, methods of learning are visual, auditory, kinesthetic, learn by se seeing, learn by hearing, learn by doing. Um, references are inherently only visual. Uh, but many people, when they're looking for something, they want to know, how do I solve my one specific problem? Okay, now that I've got that, how do I zoom back a little bit and see the general case? Oh, that was a reserved word. I thought that was a table name instead of something like that. These things start to become more obvious, and you're much more receptive to the information after you've had your immediate crisis solved. Um, the Postgres docs we have now have almost no examples. Okay, nobody booed that, so that's good. Uh, syntax definitions, they're not an example. They are a definition. Um, it's pretty good about function definitions, so it's got that. Um, but we need more. It's usually one example per function. Um, the examples they give are common cases. They're never edge cases. Um, the, we need a much more comprehensive list of function usages and inputs. It doesn't have to be on the same page as the definition. Um, and then maybe some thought to function composability, because often these things aren't used in a vacuum. There's command examples. Um, they're pretty good. They have some very simple examples in them, but it would be nice if we saw more common usage patterns in there. And then perhaps a little bit more of the context around the problem, the state of the database before and after, even if that's just describing a table. Um, and then what it totally lacks is any discussion of the pros and cons of using one particular technique over another. There's advice against some things in places, but we don't highlight it as such, and there isn't enough of it that you would expect to find it on any one given page. Enter the Postgres wiki. Um, it's a wiki. <laughs> There's, there is very little thought to the organization. Uh, it, it is organized much in the same way that uh, you do split pages on indexes. It just, you go till the page fills up, and then you make a couple of pages to handle the overflow. In that sense, it is the junk drawer of wisdom. And while what is collected there was really, really insightful at the time of collection, um, some of the stuff has begun to age. Uh, and there is nobody actively looking for you know, examples where there's a better code path now. Uh, p partitioning is really one of the areas where this has come to light, that we've completely upended the right way to do partitioning in Postgres. 
and there's just a whole lot of examples out there showing us the old way. Um, there is occasional reference from uh, the wiki to the Postgres docs, but there is obviously, and this would be very difficult to maintain, no reference the other direction. So if we were looking to push a lot of this information off onto the wiki itself, the core documentation isn't doing us any favors. So if you have a question, where are you going to go? We really ought to have an answer for this um, because otherwise they could find out the wrong answer. <sighs> Stack Exchange. Um, it, it gets the Google hits. Um, so what can I say about Stack Exchange? Um, the expertise level on there is fair to middling. And one could argue that it's a source of, that's a sign of our own success, that anybody who is uh, very knowledgeable about Postgres is currently not only employed, but overemployed, and then they don't have time to go trolling Stack Exchange looking to help people. Um, another thing is that the answers are ranked, but the ranking is essentially voting. So popular answers get bubble up higher than a good answer. Um, that's not necessarily the best. Um, like the wiki, the answers on Stack Exchange may have been right at the time they were written, and now things have changed. Okay, well, where else do you go? There is a uh, R PostgreSQL subreddit. I am on it. I occasionally answer some things on there. Um, one problem we've started to notice increasingly is that a whole lot of the questions look awfully like somebody's homework. And that is demotivating to the people giving the answers. Um, it's also not a very high traffic place. And a lot of what we get on there to drive up the traffic is people reposting questions from Stack Exchange. <sighs> okay. So now you're starting to get desperate. We have an IRC. We have a Slack channel. Well, those require a person who knows the answer to be awake and to have some spare time. So the level of responsiveness you're going to get really varies by time of day. And as a result, just with the nature of chat clients, either you're going to get an answer immediately or your question is going to be completely flooded with additional questions and just chitter chatter. So either you get the answer right away or not at all, and that leads to an are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet kind of repetition that tends to annoy the people already on the channel. And so that's not great. Um, it is a bit nicer to get that the the most oblique challenge to, hey, is this your homework project? It's a little easier to do that. Um, but with that comes a tendency to overreact and people to dismiss genuine questions as somebody's homework. Um, also, with it being immediate responses, um, getting the answer out there quickly does not mean that you necessarily double check the documents that you know to look at yourself. Um, and then worst of all is that if somebody does give a really good answer, it's gone. It's scrolled off the screen. Somebody logs Freenode. I don't know who. So then some people seek to do documentation on their own. And that comes in the form of blogs. And um, blogs come in two categories that come immediately to mind. Um, that is our own cabal of geniuses uh, who uh, have jobs that allow them to work on Postgres 100% uh, of the time. And their uh, posts tend to be uh, extremely detailed, um, almost research paper-like in their quality, but more conversational. Um, and these are a thing to be treasured. And then the other type of blog. Okay, 
blogs by experts. They're extremely detailed about an extremely small area of Postgres. As the number of Postgres developers grows, we will get more specialized, and that level of detail and that level of fine-grainedness will only increase. That's no help to a user that's seeking to hand, uh, handle more basic questions. So their questions get handled by other blogs. Um, unfortunately, uh, just with the way that uh, ad tech works and page hits and uh, things like that, these tend to be uh, done with this famous quote, quantity has a quality all its own, which means that they strive to have as many blog posts as possible. Thus, they have to dole out their own information in as small a nugget as possible in order to make sure they don't run out of things to talk about. Um, and then it is sandwiched between, hey, I'm a smart person, and come work here. Um, so at best, one third of the blog post is the actual content you were seeking. Um, and if they get the information wrong, the blog helps propagate that as well, case by case. Uh, uh, the case in point here is that quantity has quality all its own is often attributed to either Stalin or Lenin. <laughs> um, and I don't think either of them spoke English. It is, it is theorized that they have said things like this, but that is not their quote. That actually came from some US Army uh, uh, general analyst sometime in the 60s or 70s. But the quote has gotten out there, and if you've heard that before, that's probably who you thought uh, wrote it. OK, after thinking about the two types of blog, uh, blogs out there, there's a worse kind of blog. It's the copy pasta blog. Um, someone literally finds a, a nugget of information that they're literally peeling off of somebody else's site and doing the absolute minimum to make it look like it's of the quality of an unwashed masses a blog post and is not. Um, these are really awful and really can, they can't really educate and they can definitely distract. And um, yeah, it just um, makes me a little sad to think about them. Um, some people not liking the pure reading experience will go to YouTube looking for uh, answers on how to do things possibly because they've seen help for how to do things with their smartphone or, you know, or cooking recipes or whatever, um, which are medium, which are uh, activities much more suitable to the medium. Uh, and it's good for step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, the problem is, is that um, our stuff tends to be uh, more cookbook and you want to be able to copy, paste, and edit uh, the solution to suit your own needs. Um, it's as annoying as uh, the Unwashed Masses blogs, and it's got interstitial ads, so that wastes your time. And then when you're looking at this thing, you've already clicked on it, you've realized you've been fooled by the clickbait, and you've got a 10 minute video and you're confident that the actual answer to the thing that you want to know can be delivered in about 30 seconds. You just don't know which 30 seconds. So again, you start reconsidering the whole decision to have um, uh, mammals get climb out of the trees and onto the ground. Um, that leaves you Googling for answers. Um, Google has become a verb. You're going through Google. It could be DuckDuckGo, but ultimately you're hitching your wagon uh, of learning to somebody else's algorithm. Um, Google in particular loves our old docs. Um, anytime I pull up something, uh, standard command, whatever, if it existed in 8.4, I'm going <laughs> to see. <laughs> I'm going to see that one. Uh, 9.1 is getting more popular, it's, um, but basically that's where historically the clicks through Google have accumulated and it's got historical weight. Um, 
we can try to change around how our docs are physically structured, but in doing so, we're doing that based on what Google is doing now. They can and will change that algorithm later. There's not much that we can, we can't optimize for Google. Um, in entered the current links. Which version do we start the current links in? Does anybody know? 11 is the first time we did that? Okay. All right. Uh, they are doing God's work, but it is slow. The accumulated links on the current will eventually get, get past the level of the ones that were already there, but it will be slow because Google keeps serving up pages that were old. Um, hopefully, at, at some point, there is a, the current links for certain things become a tipping point and Google seems to have some sort of affinity for understanding that pages uh, that are grouped together by the leading substring are somehow similar. So the, like when one current page starts to get more uh, clout, then it starts to override the other ones. But I'm not entirely sure of that and, of course, subject to change. Um, but once those achieve a plurality, then w we're saved. That's, that's, that's good. We're saved at least um, until the point where Google changes their algorithm again. Um, so we've got that going for us. Yes? I am, I am highly reticent to start breaking links for people, um, especially when uh, somebody encounters a uh, very Baroque version of Postgres out there and they need to figure out how to get that database back on its feet and move it forward to the point where it can be upgraded. Uh, that's a stressful situation, and then having every single link be a 404, and then realizing, oh, I've got to do this substring operation on it to get the, the one I actually want. Uh, no, I don't want my name on that. So, um, I, but yes, at some point we need to do something that indicates that this is very outdated information and proceed with caution. It doesn't matter what they say now, they'll say something else in the next sprint. So, <laughs> no, it's, it, we're, we're, we're dealing with a very organic organism in, in Google and the next big advertising push will change whatever they may have done in the past. I mean, they're, they're certainly not going to commit. They're, they're not going to not do that marketing push because they told you they wouldn't. So. And, and, and hopefully the current gets there. That would be fine. That would be good. Yeah. Okay. In the back? Uh, later. Yeah. Yeah. Google sees in the docs is a thing, and we have actual technical writers that are being sicked on stuff like this. But um, I wanted to get the scope of the problem out first and then put it to them which of these things do they find juicy? Okay, so that's a lot of griping, and it makes it sound like things are really dire for Postgres, but as I said before, the only thing worse than the Postgres docs is everybody else's docs, and that's not even just databases. If you look at what's going on with Python, um, looking at a snippet on Stack, Stack Exchange of Python, it is nearly impossible to tell whether that is Python 2 or Python 3. 
Um, and that leads to a problem because certain libraries only exist in one or the other. And they often have emitted, uh, omitted the, uh, the import information that led up to uh, setting up that environment. So you're not even getting the right uh, examples. Um, and then the sheer volume of 2.x uh, Python examples has crowded out the 3. Point, uh, 3.6 and 3.7 examples that are out there. Now Python 3.0 came out <laughs> al <laughs> um, almost 11 years ago. Python 2.7 is end of life, January 1st. All previous versions of Python are already end of life. Um, but then go out on Stack Exchange and see what kind of answers you get. So, uh, Node.js. Um, it is a house of cards in a room full of hair dryers. And that is me talking about the code. I can't talk about the documentation because there isn't any. The best you can hope for is a readme.md in somebody's GitHub. And oh, by the way, that's how you deploy the code, by going to their GitHub and hoping it's up today. Um, OK, so moving on. Um, languages like C and Go have a big problem with their discoverability in that uh, their terms are um, almost entirely unsearchable. Uh, you can add lang, c lang, go lang uh, to it, but that doesn't necessarily come through the algorithm. And somebody needed to get that text into the post somewhere for Google to pick that up. That doesn't happen a lot. Now, talking about ungoogleability, uh, I need to take a side note and say that uh, if you Google for PG backrest, you're going to get a lot of stuff from the Sharper Image Catalog. Uh, and if you Google for barman, you're going to get a lot of vodka tonics and things like that, and uh, tumblers and stuff like that. Maybe not the best names we could have picked for those. OK. Uh, Linux isn't any better in this area. Um, the package naming uh, is not consistent across the various distributions. The package naming isn't often consistent within distributions. They, uh, what seems to happen is that maintainers start to rethink how they have organized uh, their packages in terms of like uh, some sort of hierarchy of classification. Um, and so from one version to another, the major, minor, minorist words in the package name get reorganized. And there's really nothing to tell you that happened, uh, which is the evolving classification methodologies. Uh, and even when you do have a good classification methodology, lots of uh, third-party software just chooses to ignore it and says, no, these are, the, these are the packages we're giving you. We don't care that they meet your naming convention. Do you want to install it or not? Um, and then, of course, version numbering that is highly based on marketing. Uh, Android and iOS definitely on the uh, on this path. Um, they're constantly changing things, things that worked, changing for changes' sake. Uh, the menuing systems that you are using on your Android phone now are not the ones you were using three months ago or the three months before that. Um, so if someone gives you instructions now. It is useless in six months, but that video will stay out there telling you how to do it wrong for years and years until it's crowded out by the next already obsolete example video. So we have some advantages in this. Um, first of all is our languages are text. We, these, these are programming languages. Uh, so screenshots and videos are rarely necessary. We can communicate in a, in a very base form. Um, above and beyond SQL itself, Postgres has made a very strong commitment to backward compatibility. So examples that worked once still work later. 
they may not do things optimally, a better way may have come along, but the old way still works. Uh, some of this is born of SQL standards and our adherence to them. Uh, and then when people are coming to Postgres from other databases, we're not that different. They have an understanding of how things ought to work and then what they're coming to the documentation for is the little tweaks in which they're different. Create table is create table pretty much everywhere. You know, uh, int, big int, that might be different. Oh, you're not using number for uh, primary keys? That's weird, but okay. You know, and then they adjust. Um, moreover, our fairly tight adherence to SQL standards means that when they do have those bits of cognitive dissonance coming in, they can say, oh, the place I came from, that was non-standard. You know, uh, MySQL's backticks to identify object names, that's the weird thing. I thought Postgres was weird. This is actually a SQL thing. Um, this works in our favor. Uh, we have always had purely numerical uh, names for our versions. Uh, now it's better in that we're doing only, we're not doing dot releases. Uh, that a person could, as the number of versions accumulates, start to get the notion that you take the Postgres version you're looking at, you add 2007 to it, and you get the version. Uh, when that version came out. Will we hold to this? I don't know, but it's going to be a pretty good approximation for a long time. Um, perils of non-numerical versions, uh, looking for Linux stuff. There's Disco Dingo, Warty Warthog. I mean, the alliterative stuff is great for marketing, but when you start to go into you know, the apt config, and try to figure out what, what string to put in there when you need to upgrade versions on a third-party repo, it's maddening. Um, Android, their version names are trampling words and candy and, and trademarked names and uh, I, I'm um, very frustrated with that. OSX, not any better. When you start Googling for things like that, if you don't include O, S, and X in the search, you will get you know, various zoo animals coming up in your results, uh, vacation de destinations, and I'm sure it's only going to get worse there. OK, so um, what can be done about this instead of complaining to your whiskey glass? Uh, I think that. Our documentation could use a glossary. Um, I went looking for one. It could occur to me that there might be one. Uh, but asking for a glossary led to the link terminology and notation. And uh, the other link back in 6.4, both of which come up to conventions, which is not an actual glossary. Um, this may seem like. Um, a, a trivial thing, but just having the database terms defined somewhere tied into our own documentation is probably really going to help somebody. And it draws people in to our more current versions <laughs> of the documentation. Um, and that is the problem, is that when you don't know what you don't know, you don't know the words to describe what you don't know. Um, and then additionally, the translations um, of a glossary are not only a mapping of English to Postgres, they're a mapping of all other languages to Postgres. So at least we're getting the person searching on the right terms. Uh, yes. Um, so um, I would like, and I had hoped for, and I looked very hard for a tool allows you to do document-like redlining, if people have seen this, where you have a version of a document and then the new document, and you can see which lines have been deleted from the old one and they're struck through, and which ones are new and they're highlighted in some friendly color. Um, this tells people not only what did change, but also is greatly reassuring in what didn't change. Um, the, the 
first place I really saw the benefit of this was in one of my hobbies was refereeing a sport called roller derby. And the, it was a very new or resuscitated sport. And so the rules were very much in flux. And when a new set of rules came out, it was important to go to the redlined portions of the document to see, oh, this is different. But even better was the ability to flip through page after page white as they could be, realizing that nothing had changed about that and I need not worry. That was very reassuring. So I went out and looked for ways to do that with HTML, like could you do this with the Postgres docs as we've got it? And there are front endy desktop tools that can kind of do it. And the problem is, is they have a very hard time telling what's a content difference and what's a styling difference. Um, so it's just not going to fit into our build system. Um, and I was feeling very bad about this because I thought this initially was going to be really one of the center proposals of this talk. And the problem is, is it doesn't, does, doesn't work that way. Um, uh, uh, in Peter's talk, he was uh, discussing some of the, the things with um, SQL standards, and they don't have it, and they're a huge organization, so they don't even have those things. They do redlining, but they do it manually. So my thought was what we can do with the documentation is start adding new and updated badges to the source, uh, to the documentation as we make changes. Now this could be a graphical, you know, new with the blammo kind of sign around it, or it could be just a text note or even a footnote around it um, showing that this feature is new in release N plus one. Uh, this feature has changed since feature, uh, uh, since version N. Go look for that. Um, and then um, if we have just changed the document but the feature is the same, have some way of saying that you know this text was clarified since the last version. And you can very easily toggle between the various releases of a page and see things that way. That footnote would at least clue you in that, oh yeah, this is different now. What you knew about this has to change a little bit. Um, and then as far as our ability to maintain it, um, pretty much whenever we uh, cut the release for uh, version N plus one, we take the, the master tree and we just blow away all those badges because that's how it was in the last release and anything we do from there get, gets badged. Um, our site ability could be made, um, uh, could be, um, I, I should say they aren't granular enough, so sorry for the slide. Um, what I would like to see is us starting to use anchor tags within pages uh, because right now if you point somebody to the substring function, they're going to get the link to the pages on string functions and there's a lot of them. If you, if you point them to the, uh, um, one of the JSONB make row functions, they're going to get the whole JSONB page instead of the one function they care about. If we put in an anchor per function, that would allow us to direct the person to a much, the, to the part they actually care about on the page that they probably ought to read later after they've satisfied their immediate need. Um, if we have, uh, um, we have use cases, it would be nice if we had uh, a, an anchor link to those. So if somebody wants to share those around, that can draw the person into our documentation, our more recent documentation. And then I would like to say that what we should ne have is that anchors should never die from one version to the next. If we do end up retiring an anchor something, we move it to a gutter at the bottom of the page. Oops. Um, and so if someone had a link to version 11 or, and that anchor died in version 14, jumping ahead, it would, they would see a positive sign that this, this example had been retired. Um, we need an example database. Uh, SQL Server and Access have some variation on Northwind and 
that allows uh, people to slowly get used to one particular data model, a data model that's not tied to their work, and that allows people to share examples of how to use things with a data set that people are familiar with and you don't have to keep re-explaining it to them. Um, this is a problem, especially on uh, like Ask Tom and uh, other oracle uh, blogs where they describe something, some little planner quirk or something like that. And those uh, run into trouble because half the blog post is them setting up the tables to do the one or two queries to show the plan that, that, that they're actually interested in. If we already had some tables available, that would be a big help. Um, but for a database like that, we need a free database. Um, existing data sets often have legal encumbrances. If you want to talk about music, you're doing with the Muse people. They have copyrighted uh, the living hell out of that stuff. Uh, movie databases, IMDB has got that covered. And yes, sir. It is, it is not, and I, um, and in a later slide I say that the goal is that it should be creatable from scratch in under five minutes. And, and how much you can do in five minutes will grow with time. So uh, that's, that's one thing that I'm going to be looking at. Um, so we can't even try to use this stuff safely in a non-commercial way because they often have trap information in there um, that, oh, wow, that went off the bottom of the slide. Bummer. Uh, it was just a link to uh, uh, trap streets uh, where a mapping company will create a fictional street so that if you start to use their data, they can take you to court and point out that this street doesn't actually exist. The only place it exists is in our map, so you must have copied it. Um, let's not get into that problem. It also needs to be an interesting database. <laughs> uh, looking around, I found a decent reference database involving USDA nutrition data. Uh, not the most spry topic in the world. Uh, more interesting data can be census data, but it's also very flat. There's no relations in it, so that's not very good. Um, and then the one database that seems to be out there is the DVD rental store. There will come a time, not too far in the future, where people start to ask, what is a DVD? And so, and the notion that you would have to go to a place, not the place you're currently at, to get these things will become confusing to them. So we got to dispense with, with that. What should this database cover? Um, we should hope that it can test most major parts of Postgres. Oops including foreign keys, partitioning, views, materialized views, all index types, triggers. Sorry for all the clicking. Um, uh, each type of trigger uh, fun functions in all the language that we currently ship with core, at least one sort procedure, generated columns, and whatever else we imagine coming up in the future for future versions. Um, uh, we would like it to be loadable in about five minutes. Uh, so if someone is recreating it from scratch, they're not too inconvenienced. Uh, the database itself should be tied to a version so that we're not worried about how to make something that was a good example back in 9.6, assuming we had one of these, work with the new partitioning stuff. Well, you needed examples for old partitioning and a 9.6 database would have been helpful for that. Um, and then, of course, there should be a table in it that has what version is this particular example database so that when people are describing these things on blogs, they can show as a form of proof which one they were using. It would be nice to have a REPL. Uh, this amounts to a hosted example database or some way of easily packaging it and putting it on your computer. Right now, the best example of I know of that is Postgres app, but that's only for OS X. Uh, it should have the ability to reset itself back to the starting form so that users are not only allowed to but encouraged to do destructive operations for their learning effect. Um, 
It would also allow people to run the commands themselves as they're reading them off some sort of cookbook or tutorial. Um, and then essentially this database could become what amounts to template too. I'm not suggesting we ship it by default, but if it's truly instructive, it could, it could eventually become that, that close. Uh, collections of recipes. Um, right now the wiki has a lot of these, uh, but it's not sure or clear what versions a particular uh, example is for. Um, it would be nice if the wiki went out of its way to use those new anchors for citations as much as possible. And then along with it, and this is what wikis are good for, not only showing the solution, but some commentary on the, what made you make that decision, how, why you chose to solve it that way. And then I would liken this to almost like sportscaster level of you know, play description where let's go to the tape and okay, well the blocker did this and that allowed this person to get through. That sort of thing really aids in educating people. Um, if we have an example database, write all the recipes against that. Um, you could even <laughs> go so far as to have the wiki essentially have regression tests where from one version to the next, it compares the query output and then s to instruct us as to whether we need to uh, break off this particular, um, uh, this particular example into a version, you know, version n and down and a new one for n plus one. And then of course we would have to basically review that right about release time. And would this be Google summer of testing? I don't know. <laughs> they seem to be finding new things to have summers about. So I, <sighs> a lot of people coming to Postgres are coming from another database. Um, if we had some sort of guide that is a, oh, wel welcome here from Oracle, here's what's different. Um, and that would be very version specific uh, to basically acclimate the person to these things. You know, um, you know, coming from SQL Server, well, yes, we have identity columns now and they work very similarly, but you should know that we always also have these things that are kind of Oracle-ish called sequences and they often get used for the, the same purposes. So you know, that would be um, a uh, big help to people. And it also is a chance for us to toot our own horns and say, you know, look, you, know, you had to do this in this way in SQL Server, and now you got a choice of ways to do it. Um, maybe this goes in the wiki, maybe it goes in core docs, I don't know. Um, it would be nice if we had a way to enlist people to becoming archaeologists. I, that is the term I'm sticking with because uh, it sounds better than vigilantes. Mm -hmm. um, that collect submissions of code examples, look, exa uh, look for examples of them, basically trolling Stack Exchange, looking for where someone is wrong on the internet. And uh, where possible, incorporate those things into the wiki. Uh, in the case of bad examples, see if you can correct them in place. If the Stack Exchange article is still open, post a correction. Post a correction with lots of citations. If it looks professional, it will get upvotes. Um, this is where I think that Google Summer of Docs may come in uh, a bit in that um, they're going to be probably very good at outlining those examples uh, in a much more formal way than say programmers would be. So finally, what can we do within Postgres itself? Uh, the PSQL commands are pretty cryptic. Uh, show of hands, anybody know what this one describes? Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, I tried to make a patch for verbose backslash describe commands and I may still try to push that, but I think there's a move towards could we have an actual server level command for describe where someone would say describe table foo, describe function with these parameters. And the, the output would be the uh, equivalent of whatever the 
appropriate D level command would, would have been had the person been using PSQL and known the incantation required. It could also possibly have a JSON output, which would then in turn make it queryable. Um, the challenge here is that all of the stuff that does describes inside of PSQL is on the client side and we would need to move it over to the server side and that's going to have some issues with cross-pollinating our, our there is no DMZ for client and server code inside the, the source tree, is there? There is? Yeah, the, it, yeah it, it's a very good question where it's going to belong. I certainly didn't know the answer. Um, it would be nice if we had uh, a sub-variety of the show command for show create. And what these would essentially be is the PG dump output of a particular uh, um, object that you've just described. Um, and pretty much whatever PG dump did for that particular thing, if you tried to dump just that one object, that's what I would like to see this do. Same problem that you've got some client side code that would now have to live in and be shared in two places. Um, show help. This one's getting a little further afield because um, it's like, do we want to store all this text in the core database? I don't know. Do we want the database fetching web pages? Uh, I'm not, not, not real comfortable with that. Um, but it would be nice that a person could get a level of help at the server level at least as much as they get it at the PSQL level. Um, and this could be something that ends up being uh, an extension that uh, we tie on or something like that. So those are some dreamy things about what Postgres could change to be. What can you do in the meantime? Start setting a good example with the code that you put in blogs and things like that. Um, simple, say what day it is. You know, it's always tough when you're like f seeing a news article um, that someone shared with you and it sounds like something that's really imminent danger and then you realize it was from 2015. So it's no problem at all. Put a date in your code examples. Um, put version examples in there and version examples of any tools you use to do that example. Um, Stack Exchange and things like that have, you know, a date on your comment and stuff. But that data may get scraped away um, when somebody else tries to put this on their copy pasta site. So don't trust them to do that. And it can be as simple as this. Just at the start of your example, pop that at the top, and then you know it's people can see whether this is going to be relevant for their concerns. Um, yes, ag again, show it in the code itself. Um, when you are citing the docs, and please cite the docs a lot, use the most granular link possible. Uh, get it down as narrow as possible so the person is seeing the most relevant thing. The whole page is going to load. That's theirs to read if they want it, but try to do the best to give them the most specific thing. Um, the question is, do we cite the current version that they're using, or do we cite the current documentation? Well, that's kind of case dependent. Um, and it also depends on whether we orphan anchors or not. I, if we don't, and I really hope we don't, that's a good argument for using current a whole lot more than using the version specific stuff. If we do end up orphaning anchors, then the current version makes more sense. Uh, other pitfalls when documenting. Um, graphical documentation uh, is very, very nice and very, very instructive and helps me a lot but it's not handicap accessible. Um, and you need to have alt tags for those things. And these concerns are not going to ever get less important as time goes on. And it may get to the point where there is regulation concerning the accessibility of your website and can you be shown in certain countries. So in this case, because we're so text-based, we're a lot less exposed to this than other people. Uh, but we are not immune to it. So, wrapping up, 
There's a lot of information out there. Some of it is wrong. Maybe you want to fix it. Some of it used to be right and now isn't. We can't control it, but we can try to counterbalance it, overwhelm the bad information with better, more inviting information. Uh, we could be doing a lot more about this than we are, but we've been busy making Postgres itself better that we haven't, that the docs have lagged a little bit. Uh, it would definitely enhance our reputation to do so. And we would have fewer, fewer homework-like questions to answer. And most importantly, we could tell people to read the fucking manual <laughs> without it being an insult. Thank you. We're really short on time. I don't think, uh, do we have any time for questions or like? Oh, okay. No. <laughs> Read the manual. <laughs>